Hi there. Hello, everyone. So we're so excited to be here for Out of This World Summer Programming. And just a quick little bio about who we are. Um, I'm going to throw it to Jen first. Jen's the teen librarian at the Westboro Public Library and a former school teacher. Hi. And I'm the circulation supervisor at the Westboro Public Library. I was also a teen librarian for 11 years. And on the side, I own a trivia company. I've been doing that for about five years now. And I've hosted tons of trivia competitions in addition to the teen events we're going to talk about. So first, you might ask, why us? Why are we watching a presentation from these two? We, we were available. available. And we also have a combined 36 years of planning team program experience in quite a few different realms, both in libraries and schools, even in churches and other, other backgrounds. We've done at quite a few youth events. We've spoken at a number of conferences and workshops on various young adult topics, but our favorite topic to talk about is programming. Fun fact, this is our first webinar, so bear with us. If I go through the slides too quickly, feel free to comment. We have a lot to get to today. We timed it out. We should be good, but just in case, um, just let us know what you need in the comments. Here's an overview of what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to briefly talk about some attendance tips and marketing ideas for your programs. Then we're going to go into our rapid fire program idea segment, and then we're going to try to have a little time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, but here's our little alert. The following webinar is meant to spark ideas and inspiration for different events you might want to offer, but this is not a step-by-step -step guide on how to plan every single event. <laughs> Many of the things we're going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to talk about, we could probably have a webinar on each one of them because they're very detailed programs. So um, we, we want to make sure that you can get some information for ideas, but then we're going to give you a contact email address in a minute where you can email us for any guides to the specific events to get more details on them. So jumping right in now, talking about getting a crowd, um, you can have the best ideas in the world, but if you don't market them well, your hard work can go to waste. Very depressing. Throughout the program today, we're going to throw up a few of these free sources, sites that we really love and use often. You might want to note them down. They're things that um, you might find very handy as you are planning your teen programs. And if you haven't heard of Defont.com, it could be your new best friend in making library posters. It is a website that has free downloadable fonts. Um, the free source logo there that was done with a font I got off Defont. And you can limit it to search just free ones, 100% free or free for non-commercial use fonts. And it's completely legal. Um, the only thing that I warn people with when they're on defont.com is do it in a private location because some people design some fonts that are a little vulgar, but for the most part, they're a lot of fun. So that's a great resource to make your posters stand out from just the generic fonts that might be on your computer already. All right. So um, another thing you can do to get a crowd is don't dismiss Facebook. Uh, teens are not, may not be using it, but their parents are. and Sometimes that's the best way. They're, the parents are the one that know their schedule sometimes better than them. So um, always post things on Facebook. Uh, I personally had a haunted house that filled up just on Facebook. I'd never even had a chance to do my press release. I just posted one little thing on Facebook and it filled up in, in a day. So. Yeah, I've gone to a couple of marketing workshops where the presenters dismiss Facebook saying teenagers don't use it anymore. But um, in reality, it's still being used to get news to teens, just maybe not as directly as it used to be. Um, another thing you could do is ask your teen advisory boards to talk on um, the events up for you at school. But the, the twist is give them volunteer credit for it. So if they need volunteer hours, if you've been a teen librarian or are a teen librarian, you probably, you probably know you get a million requests, especially around the summer, for how can I earn volunteer hours. And getting them to talk up your events around either school or during the summer just in their social media circles, give them credit for doing that. And they'll have fun and your word will get out there because word of mouth is the best marketing tool for your events. That's, that's how I did my Teen Choice survey. I used uh, everybody, every teen that got somebody to take the survey got credit for it and they loved it. Yeah, be creative with those service hours. There's really no rules as to what you can give a service hour for. And if it can help market your events, that is a really good use of a volunteer credit hour. Now, teens and their parents also have access to different online boards that you as a library employee may not. 
So encourage them to post there as well, again, for volunteer hours. And, and I, I would say this goes back to that Facebook thing. A lot of teens are not on Facebook for themselves, but they are for their school events. There's like a class Facebook page or their student council. So again, that's where they post all these things and they get seen a lot better than from my word of mouth. Um, and then also just search online for some local boards that you may be able to post things for for free. In our area, there's a great one. I'm not sure about New York, but check your neighborhoods. Um, and it's a great volunteer job just to give the teen volunteers your monthly calendar and say, input these on these free online calendars. It's a nice way to get that the word out there and also give teens a volunteer job. Another tip I really like is if you have trouble filling up an event for teens, open it up to families. You can still require a teen to attend, but tell them they can invite a parent or sibling. I have found that with certain things that I think are going to be popular and then they don't take off like I think, when I say, okay, you can invite a parent and make it like a parent and a teen event or invite your siblings or invite anyone in your family who wants to come, the numbers tend to go way up because while there may be that perception that hanging out with your parents isn't cool, sometimes the library folks, um, they tend to be a little more shy, not all of them, but they can be more shy and they feel safe if the parent or sibling is with them. And I've had great success in having events like this attract new people into the teen groups, which are teen only, um, because they have that comfort level then with the library and going to the library for an event. So just another idea. And one thing I would add to that too is, some, uh, is uh, I have my older teens sometimes help with the events because they don't necessarily want to attend, but they like to help volunteer. And that pulls in their friends and, and the younger teens or tweens, they just get a kick out of seeing the teens doing it and it gives them something to aspire to. All right. All right, so we are going to go rapid fire now with a bunch of events that we love. We're gonna hit some highlights, but we won't have time to go in depth on all of them. So you can note down the address below. That's the Gmail account that we both have access to. So if you see a program idea that you like, but are a little confused because we're gonna go so quickly, um, just send us an email and we can, we can send you sometimes templates, we can send you some of the tips we've learned, some of the things we've done wrong with those types <laughs> of events, because we've learned a lot, of a, le a lot of lessons over all those years of doing these programs. So we will not get frustrated if you send us an email. It may take a few days for us to reply, but um, we welcome that because we love collaborating with other people. I've had, um, when I did an escape room once, I was having people contact me from across the country because I did an escape room like four years ago and it hadn't been done in a lot of libraries at that point. So it's really fun when you can help spread your hard work to other libraries because then you can you know, help impact that community and it's, it's just such a good feeling. So don't feel like you're inconveniencing us for sending us an email. All right, here we go with the first event we're going to talk about. Oh, that's right. I forgot. We are going to rate everything on an estimated cost scale. We advertise this as something that would cover things for any budget. So we're going to go, we'll have a $1 sign means it's something you can do really, really cheap to about 75 bucks. Um, $2 signs, we're thinking 75 to 200 and $3 signs are the super expensive events. Um, now, keep in mind, though, that you can make a cheap event really expensive if you have the money to spend through prizes and promotions and food. Um, and you can take some of the more expensive events and bring the cost down by looking for donors. But this is our general guideline on what kind of funds that we spent when we did these events. So you can plan accordingly. All right. Oh, and prizes. Uh, don't overdo it because we found that the teens, they're very happy just to be made, you know, made a big fuss over. I have a lot of success just using chocolate bars and, and candy. So you don't need to overdo it. Yeah, sometimes just coming to the event is exciting right. enough and being competitive and bragging rights. Um, if you have the money to spend, sure, they love prizes, but it won't be your, it, you don't need a huge prize to get a huge crowd. Sometimes if you have a theme, we had like ducks one year and they just like those little rubber, rubber ducks. ducks. Oh, that's funny. So Awesome. So we're going to start now with our first one. I'm going to take this one, Family Trivia Nights. I love hosting trivia events. I've hosted over 300 trivia nights. I am a trivia nerd myself. I love that I could bring this into the library world uh, successfully. So um, they're pretty cheap to run, too. It takes a lot of your work. <laughs> it's some hard work putting the, the shows together. But once you get a template, and I can share my template with you, um, it doesn't take as long as you might think. And if you can develop a good relationship with a local pizza shop, um, it's a great event to pair with a pizza dinner. Uh, we, I like doing it in a team format. You can do an individual format for Trivia Night, but I found that the team, the team formats are great. I've done team formats being just teenage teams um, for like lunches. 
or I do like a family dinner with the pizzas, um, come up with a theme. The possibilities are pretty endless for these themes. Um, and I'll, we're gonna talk about a couple of things that we've done for themes, um, some of them being around the world. I like doing an amazing race style one where I literally plot out a trip around the world and then ask questions about the different countries. And it's not overly difficult because I can pull from people, famous people in America who were born in these countries or famous sports players from those countries. And then I go into some of the customs of those countries. So it's not only a fun event, but it's very educational. Uh, we, we, I like doing ones on books. I know you've done some on books. Um, Harry Potter, I did one of my first ones was a Twilight trivia night. The one time I read a Twilight book. Um, <laughs> I've done Hunger Games. Like, there's a lot of different book theme trivias you can do. And um, I also love logo challenges. An app came out probably four or five years ago on logos that the teens still till I did, I hosted one of these last year. It's still very popular to try to name different logos. And I'm gonna show you a sample from that one in a minute. But what I do is I put all the questions in a PowerPoint presentation and project them to teams sitting in groups. So you would really need to have a projector, which most libraries do. And um, here, so then they would see projected on a big wall. This is a, an actual slide from the logos challenge that I did, called it Lunch and Logos. I did it over the summer, just had teams come in. Um, I'd have different topics, so I would do logos from toys and games. I do logos, phrases, so things might be something to the effect of just asking a question uh, from a brand like You Sunk My. That is it. Yep. <laughs> and then also name the game that this is traditionally featured in. So I do questions about the game pieces in addition to just the logos. And this is Monopoly, but I disagree. Yeah, it looks like Battleship, but it's yeah. Monopoly piece. So I would, as I'm going through those slides, I've provided the teams with answer sheets and pencils. I divide the questions into 10 rounds of 10 questions a piece for easier scoring. I've gotten a little bit crazy with the scores and I've gotten really simple and I've found that it's very, it's, it's a lot better to go simple. I said two points a question correct. So then when our hardworking mm -hmm. scorekeepers, I usually get a volunteer to help me with the scorekeeping. Um, they, it's easier for them to count up, tally up the score when everything's two points. Because one time I was like, oh, this one's harder, so I'll give that one five points. It got way too confusing. So I would, I would suggest just simplified scoring. And if you don't have a volunteer, that simplified scoring will um, will be really important. I've done I've done a few events with just me doing all the scoring at the library, and having that just two points a piece was a lifesaver. Um, so at the end of each round, I would collect the answer sheets and then keep a tally of the score. Um, here's another free source that you may or may not know about. It's called Mikogo. Mikogo is a free screen sharing software you can download on your computer. So if you have, if you're projecting onto one wall, but you have a, a, a bigger crowd or cr more people interested in the event that would fit outside of just one room, you can go to another projector and another, uh, another computer and project the same thing in the same real time on another wall. I was hosting trivia at a temporary library location that was not cohesive to doing library events. And when I, uh, when I was able to find this software, I could actually go bring one big crowd of people into, not big crowd, but a moderate sized crowd into one of the small rooms, and then another moderate crowd size into another one of the small rooms using this service to double the size of the event. Because when you put a lot of hard work into an event, you want to get as many people there. That goes without saying. So this service helped with that. So it's free if you want to get one extra screen. If you were in a building where you could need multiple screens, you can pay to add more than one. But it's a really nice service to be aware of. Another really great resource is a uh, free source is Scorekeeper XL. I know for a fact that this is good for iPads and for iPhones. I'm not sure if they have an Android version. Um, I'm kind of an Apple guy. So, <laughs> but this, um, this here is a free scorekeeping tool that is very crisp, very user friendly, and you can use this for more than just trivia. It tallies, you can tally, the, you enter the scores in, it puts them in order of greatest to lowest or vice versa. You can type in the team names, choose colors, it has some very fancy sound effects too, if you're into that. <laughs> if you have an extra projector at your trivia night, you can also project the scoreboard on the wall the whole time. I've done that a couple of times, it's very nice, but a lot of times I'm just using that Mikogo to do another screen versus the scoreboard, but it's a really nice tool. If you'd like a template, um, just send us an email to that address earlier and I'll send a template along for you to customize uh, for your trivia questions and see kind of how I've done mine. And then you can make tweaks according to your groups uh, but I'm happy to share that. And after after a lot of these um, after a lot of these programs we're talking about, I'm going to try to throw in a summer reading connection. Outer space is our theme this year. So 
Um, you could throw a solar system trivia around in. I'm not sure if you could get a huge crowd just calling it solar system trivia, but he could throw well, a out of this world. Trivia. Yeah, out of this world out trivia. This that world would work. Trivia. And you could go all over. Um, okay. Or yeah, you could ask questions about aliens and pop culture. So that's one idea there. All right. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is escape rooms. Um, and if you haven't heard of escape rooms, it's uh, the latest craze and they're all over the place. And the first time I heard about it, I wanted to take part because I love puzzles and challenges that way. And it just so happened that Dan was hosting a session on how to how to host your own. And I thought it was great and I attended it. And since then I've hosted about three of my own. In fact, I have another one of mine starting Thursday. Awesome, awesome. Now, at first these are a little more expensive to plan because you need to get a lot of props. They're very prop based. But the way to pitch it, if you have like a friends group or any sort of uh, funding source, you can pitch it as it's a high one-time cost, but once you buy these props, you can just recode things. So any additional rooms that you do in the future, you can use a majority of those props again. And I mean, while things may get damaged in the room, a lot of the locks that come in the lock boxes that you can purchase, uh, they're very durable and they're made for withstanding crowds or someone trying to break into something. Right. And they're really, they're, it's something you can use over and over again. And, and keep that in mind when buying your locks, buy the ones that you can program your own um, combinations because that way you can get more use out of them yeah and don't go cheap on the locks because i have tried mm -hmm. purchasing a few cheap locks before that can be easily broken into it's not it, it's worth spending the money one time and then having quite a few things to use in the future after the first after the first escape room is done now and again a little background an escape room also known as an escape game it's a physical adventure game in which players solve a series of puzzles and riddles using clues and there's usually an objective at hand. So it might be getting out of the room or it might just be opening up a certain box. It's an escape room. The name itself is a, is a bit misleading if you're not breaking out of a room. So that's why a lot of people call them escape games as well. And if your library doesn't have a good place to just put a little room in, like take over a closet or take over part of a meeting room or something, you can even run an escape game in the whole building, kind of national treasure style, like putting clues around the building that are in plain sight and get, giving people uh, like different challenges to go around the building. So I've talked to some people who say, oh, I love the idea of an escape room, but it's just not, won't work for my facility. And I would <laughs> challenge them back saying, I bet you could find a way to do it, even if it's utilizing your whole building as that escape game. But the biggest, the biggest thing that people like about escape rooms is the clock. It's, yeah. It's having that clock countdown and the competition that they have with that is yeah, there's a lot of teamwork involved. So instead of having a challenge where it's people versus each other, it's everyone versus the clock. And that becomes the best nemesis of all. Right. And, and people who don't even know each other become fast friends in that hour right. because they're trying to have, they have the same goal in hand at hand. So one of our tips is if you really are confused with escape rooms, go to one. This is how I first decided to bring them to libraries. I went to an escape room. I observed a lot of the elements and then it struck me that I could do this. The the first one I ever did was in a little coffee shop where they set one up and it was in it was in Maine and the group uh, running it were they were I'm sorry it was New Hampshire and the group running it was just like like using things like playing cards and simple bike locks and I was having a blast and I was like if I could I could afford playing cards I own playing cards I can right. I own a bike lock I could bring some of these things um, to the library and make a challenge there. And escape rooms are pretty expensive. If you haven't been to one, they tend to be between $20 and $30 a person for one hour session. So families who may not be able to to pay for that, a family of four going to an escape room is around 100 bucks. They love the fact that the library will do one and they don't mind if it's not as high tech as some of the escape room companies out there. So another tip, if we just go oh, sure. before we go ahead, is um, if you'd like to do this in your library, but you just don't know how to start, there is a company called Breakout Edu, BreakoutEDU.com, and it, it's just a good place to start. And they, I, I would say you don't need to buy their kit because it has a whole kit of locks, but there is a website that people have uploaded their plans, and it's just kind of a neat way to, to go through them. It's free, and you can see what other people are doing. It just gives you a place yeah. to start. Yeah, no, and yeah, that between that and going to your own, you'll you'll you're you'll start getting some really great ideas. Mm -hmm. And your ideas will start when you develop your theme. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the themes you've so done? So I've I've done la we we I started with doing one, I tried to time it into the summer program, so I did one on the history of our town because they were having a big celebration. But I've also done Harry Potter and a music one last year to go with Library Rocks. And this year I'm very excited we're gonna do the office. Um, yep. Escaping Dwight. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Um, I've done ones um, based on an alien invasion, which would work really well for this year. I've done a, just a generic, like, mysterious office. What's mysterious about it? Um, not the office, but <laughs> an office. And then I've done, my, my most popular one was Alice in Wonderland, where I had 120 people register for this event in 11 minutes. And when I say that, that's not, I didn't live in a community that was huge where this was normal. <laughs> this was a shock to me when I started getting phone calls saying, why can't we get in? It's only 20 minutes into registration. And I was like, oh no, something didn't work. And then I looked, um, I used Eventbrite for my registrations because they have a really nice way to organize the time. And if you, if you have a free event, Eventbrite doesn't charge you. And it feels really legitimate because it prints a real ticket. And of the 120 people that signed up for tickets, only four did not show up, which in the library okay. programming world, yeah. for me, I consider that a big win. Yeah. So develop your theme. Find something you like, something that ties into the summer reading theme or just something you're passionate about and start creating games around that. Now, you might say, what do you mean create games around that? There's a really good website. I put it on the board there. It is .co. It's not, there's not, it's not missing the M. Um, lock, paper, scissors. They have some ideas. They're going to try to sell you stuff, but you just go there for ideas. Um, they, they illustrate a lot of puzzles you might see in an escape room when you go into one yourself as a player. And from there, you can get ideas for things you might want to bring into your own individual escape room. And something else to keep in mind with your theme, you, you don't want to cut people off from going. So just because you don't know the office, you don't know Harry Potter. So you want to make sure that everything you need to solve it is in, is in the room somehow. So keep that in mind when you're making your clues and your riddles that it's fun. It should be fun for people that like those themes, but it should be something that they can do if they don't yeah, know it. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. Now, as I, we said at the beginning, I, I've literally run an, an hour-long escape room workshop. So this, this is, again, just here to inspire. But if you have some questions about running your own, definitely let us know. And some of the, one of the connections to the summer reading theme, you could use Constellation as puzzle clues, or you could get more punny with it and use empty space puzzles. An empty space puzzle is where you have people line up certain pieces. You might see that's the bottom puzzle there. And if they do that, if you put these pieces in order, if you look in the white area, you see a code for a lock. So there's three, four, one, two, three, oh. And if you see those numbers, it's just in the space that is empty. So that that is a fun place. And, and, and if you look really carefully, there are actually items that were, it's gonna be part of my uh, office escape room, so you can, it's a challenge to see how each, what each one has to do with the office. Yeah, so that, that's really fun. I'm looking forward to seeing how people react to that one. Oh, also some are reading themes, Star Wars, which yeah, is a really popular one. one. Yeah. All right, so another um, popular summer program that we do at our library is um, outdoor movie nights. And outdoor movie nights might sound like a very simple, straightforward question. They, it's a nice way to get a huge crowd, um, but it's super, super expensive. And it can be a headache. It mm -hmm. can. A, we, we find it <laughs> worth it. We love it. But um, it's not as easy as some people might think. I actually talk to people about this frequently because there are, there's, our library's done it for a little while now. And I've gotten calls like, how do you guys do that? Mm -hmm. I want to do it where I'm at. And you probably realize you need a movie license to show movies legally. I hope you do. <laughs> um, because that's really important. Do not violate that. Because it's very important for especially our industry to respect the copyrights for these movies. Um, there's two licenses that are the most popular out there, the Swank license and the MPLC. But there is a stipulation that if you want to show a movie outside, there is an additional fee. Even if you have the indoor license, um, you still have to pay an extra fee if you want to show it outdoors. That's even outdoors on your property. Um, and there are even showing guidelines. Like Disney has very strict parameters on what time of year right. you can show their film. Week by week. I mean, some yeah. of them are within like two or three weeks that you can show it. Yes. So a lot of people think if you have the if you own the movie in your library and you have an inflatable screen, you can just do the movie outdoors. But it's not that simple. You have to pay the extra license fee. You have to make sure you schedule it with the studio appropriately. And the best place to start with doing that is to contact your licensing company. They have someone on uh, the Swank uh, company has somebody on their staff who is their sole job is to aid with the showing of outdoor movies and the licenses yeah. for that. So be sure to be, um, be aware of that. Um, but Don't worry about the weather. Yeah. And you worry yeah. about the weather then too. And anytime you do anything outdoors, um, but for the summer reading connection, it could be a lot of fun because the um, Star Wars movies are covered by the Swank license right now. Although, always check your license. They change their, they have one-time license fees, then it's totally free. It, it goes. I think, are they all covered or is it just, I guess. I, I always check to see which ones you have. 
Um, and then an idea, if you work um, in a library that is able to bring some of your library resources to your outdoor movie nights, maybe you're showing it off site. Um, I run a mobile library at the movie nights outdoors where I actually bring new library card applications and some of the, the featured things we have and check things out uh, manually to people. So they can, uh, people who may not come into the library will go to see a free movie outdoors. It's a great way to attract new folks to the resources you're, and things you're doing right at your library. We bring uh, lawn games and snacks and it becomes a whole, it's a, it's a, it's a whole month. Yeah, oh. no, that's great. So let's move <laughs> on to cooking competitions. Okay, so the most popular programs, first of all, I'm sure you know, any, any programs you do with teens have to have food, whether it's snacks or, but um, my most favorite, the one that I get the most kids to is uh, Cupcake Wars. And every year they just sell out right away. Yeah, and it, it can be expensive to run these because depending on how many people you want, you have to multiply that by the supplies you get. And when you're right. doing something like a um, create your own XYZ, you need to have some equal sets of supplies for right. every person involved. So that's why this one can get a little pricey. Right. I, I've cut down some of the costs by making my own cupcakes and we also, we, we did things where um, sometimes I, I limit the number of supplies that we get by giving out there, you know, there's some challenge that they have to do to compete and in you know, the first five get more things than others. So that's a way of cutting it down. Yeah, it, and you can also, yeah, crazy. they can yeah. get crazy. And establishing, you can make a pantry for yourself too, <laughs> where instead of giving every kid a tub of chocolate frosting, just have mm -hmm. a frosting station where they can run over and, and get the frosting in the one place. I've also run cooking competitions based on chop, the chop model, mystery, ba uh, mystery bags worth of things. I worked in a library that was right next to a 7-Eleven at one point, and I had the friends group buy um, $7.11 gift cards for every teen and told them they had to go shopping for their ingredients at the 7-Eleven, and the 7-Eleven was super cool with, uh, with doing that. And then I just said, you have to create it any dish you want using 7-Eleven gift card for 7-Eleven, and it was, it was super fun. Um, now, this is important upon registration. Make sure you have the teens list their allergies. There is so much crossing of <laughs> materials and ingredients here that you want to make sure that you have a parent signature on hand. And also check with your local board of health. I've heard of board of health that won't allow this type of event at all. And you don't want to be posting all these awesome pictures of your event and then get, have your library get fined because you weren't supposed to do it. So make sure you check with your board of health on your food yeah, restrictions. I would agree with that. So. <laughs> And in terms of tying this into the summer reading theme, um, you can, so this is what's great about a challenge. You can just issue anything you really want and the teens, it's up to them to do it. So you could say, come up with a space theme cupcake, right. um, do something inspired by a star or a constellation. Um, it, it's up to them. And it, yeah, I mean, last year I just said, do something on the theme. I didn't even, <laughs> they, I left it up to them and I was thinking, what are they gonna do? But they blew me away with their ideas. So. Yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of fun. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of cleanup. Now, if you have any sort of judging component when you're doing these events, one tip I would have for you, if you're if you get these judges, I like asking like local restaurants and local just local celebrities, so to speak, to come be the judges. I send all the young adult participants out of the room for the judging. So that way, if the judges have observed anything being created that is either really unappetizing or doesn't look safe to eat. <laughs> the teens won't get their feelings hurt if the judge refuses to have it. And then the judges won't feel bad for not eating it because they're in front of the teen who is judging it. I've done that from the start and it always works out really well. We always tell the teens, okay, leave the room now so the judges can have impartial judging and be completely fair. And I have a waiting area for them or that with a snack ready just so they can kind of cool down from their competition. And then the judges can go through. And I've had quite a few judges say, nope, there is no way I am trying that. So it's, it's part I've of kinda, I've kind of gone a different way because I did start with the celebrities my first year, but I actually just get some of my high school graduates and college students who will eat anything and tell me <laughs> that they will eat anything and they have judged it and, and I haven't had any problems with yeah, that. Well, and, they, and, and actually the kids get a kick out of watching them eat it and they kind of get it. They, they say to me, oh, we want to be a judge, can't wait to graduate. So it's kind of built oh, on cool. that. That's great. So a couple different year, avenues year, to but, take with that. That's good. I was able to get a local, um, uh, there's a pizza chain in our area that was uh, donated pizza for a year to this program and they sent their district manager to be one of the judges, which was really exciting. So this kind of thing is a really great thing to put out in press releases um, because the local businesses will really see it as great exposure for them. All right. Scavenger hunt. Scavenger. Who doesn't love a scavenger hunt? Yeah, I, I hear scavenger hunt as an adult. I get very excited still. I want to continue. I do too. Um, what, 
I they're mean, very. Somebody would run some teen, I know, right? Teen <laughs> programs for adults. That'd be awesome as a program there, I think. Right. But um, <laughs> these are one of the cheapest things to run. Um, again, a great event to pair with pizza dinner at the end or pizzas right. in some way, but you don't even need that. You just need some creative or creativity. Um, you could either have people find things and bring them back for points, or Jen and I both love photo scavenger hunts. Mm -hmm. We compile lists of things we know. Now, you had another I, thing I, you did with was, yours. Um, yeah, it was just answering questions. So I went around town and I had them do things like how many red doors were, was on a certain street or at the high school, how many how many plaques were there and things that they could look up. So, because like you said, finding things, then at the end of it, you're left with a bag of things that nobody wants. So yeah, yeah, the things the photo ones, ones are the things easier. ones seem fun until then everybody leaves and you have a table full of garbage that it's you do not know to exactly. Them, yeah. And you know, even and like ratty stuffed animals they found in a gutter literally. Yeah. Happened. So. <laughs> Well, some um, of that is fun. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the way to connect that to a um, the summer reading theme, your hunt list could include a book with an alien on the cover or name of planet. There's a lot of different ways to interpret that. Um, you could even put on the list, find something related to the summer reading theme okay. or take a picture of the, you can, I like to, um, actually the planets would be a great one to do. Um, when the Avengers, the first Avengers came out, I did a photo scavenger hunt where I, I printed out pictures of each of the Avengers and put them in different locations um, on, out on the exterior of the library building where I worked. And the photo hunt challenge, one of the challenges was find all of the Avengers and take pictures of them consecutively. So they had to run around the building and take them, uh, the whole group of Avengers. You could easily do that with the planets. Put up the planet, mm -hmm. put them on different places, and they'd have to find the planets in different locations. Again, these challenges are so cheap to run because you just literally need a printer and then you tell them to bring their cameras or camera phones. You yeah. tell them to make sure it's charged, but they are providing the bulk of the supplies. This is, a, this is a good one to have as a family too, because yeah. especially if you want them walking around town, it's nice yeah. if they have older siblings or, or uh, parents that are taking part so you don't have to worry about them. Yeah, when I did a teen only photo scavenger hunt, I made sure I had waivers on hand because they would be going throughout the town. Um, also another thing, if you do a photo scavenger hunt or a scavenger hunt, notify your local police department on the non-emergency line. Um, we did have, um, the first time I did this, <laughs> a lot of these things we learned from the first time we did it. Um, the first time I did this, the local police um, were called because of so many people asking the same question to the same people. <laughs> um, we had like find a Dunkin' Donuts cup and people thought it was weird that teens were yeah. stopping in the road to take a picture of a cup that was, you know, in a gutter. So let the, um, let the, or the business know. Yeah. have them going into a business, let them know too. Yeah. Don't put something on your sheet for them to do. If you haven't consulted with the people in question, for instance, like, like I contacted the Dunkin' Donuts and the 7-Eleven along the route that the people often would go. So it just let the people know along the way that um, that people may be coming. Um, I also have the people wear name tags of what they're doing. I, I started doing that um, because then when they're out in public, they have a name tag. They look like they're part of a challenge and they're not as daunting as people just walking up to people saying, can I take your picture, please? Like for some reason, they may not know. All right. All right. So Harry Potter birthday party. I mean, Harry Potter has been out for so long, but yet it's still one of the most popular popular things we do. Uh, if you don't know, July 31st is Harry's birthday. And every year I have some version of a birthday party with cake, uh, with trivia, with a scavenger hunt, any of those things combined. We've done Quidditch. You can do any any number of things and you can do it pretty cheaply. Um, yeah, and just you can do it every year. Yeah, depending on your budget, this can be very cheap or very expensive. You can go all out. Um, you could show one of the Harry Potter movies if you have one of those yeah. licenses that are on there. You can you can really. It's, we did a ha interactive Harry Potter birthday party one year. Yeah, so so there's a lot you can do with that, um, and it never gets yeah, old. Never gets old. <laughs> oh, Minute to Win It is uh, very exciting. In case you didn't know, Minute to Win It is an, a show that used to be on TV, and they're basically little minute games that you do and you can compete we've done it actually dan and i competed yeah. against when we worked at different libraries our libraries competed against each other uh, challenge. Nice nice challenge. but sometimes you can do it you know in your i've done it with the different schools competing against each other or or teens versus their parents versus younger siblings you can, and it's pretty cheap you just need things like cups and cotton balls and like you see in this picture oreo cookies you probably um, have a lot of the supplies lying around your library, maybe in the break room or in a storage closet, any way that you can incorporate it in. Um, and this is, this is another one, kind of like the escape room, where it might cost a little more the first time. But you can, like, these are a lot of those supplies you can keep and use over year, 
yeah. year in and year out. Yeah, and if you just Google Minute to Win It game ideas, you will have more than enough information, probably too much information that you need because there are so many Minute to Win It games. This, that whole show was developed on being able to do them at home yeah. and put them on YouTube. So it's, it's a really easy program that has the brand recognition. People really, um, people really go crazy for anything that they're familiar with that they can then participate in. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, one of my uh, favorite types of programs to run is destructive crafting. Um, by destructive, I mean crayon melting. Um, you can market it as crayon melting. You can market it as destructive crafting. Um, this is one of the few craft programs that I've, I've run quite a few of them over the years, but this is one of the ones that I've had to add multiple sessions to. And I've also had a lot of guys involved. Sometimes it's hard to get guys involved in crafting programs, but you just mentioned that there's a heat gun and melting crayons and they're there. Everyone's there. Now, this um, event is pretty cheap to run. Um, you just need some crayons. You need a heat gun and then cheap canvases. Don't, don't splurge on any of those things because you, it, it, you're melting the crayons. It's, um, I had a lot of fun with this um, quite a few times. Not the first time, though, and that's why I wanted to talk about this one. The first time I did it, I made the mistake of doing this event and melting crayons indoors. Do not do that because the fumes from crayons, we had to clear a room. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was awful. So, what, I, what you do is you gather the teens in inside and you can have them glue the crayons on the top part of the canvas. You may be able to see here on the top. Uh, you can have them put any colors they want together. I really liked this um, sample one though because it looks like a galaxy. So that would tie in really well to the summer reading theme if you do those col that color scheme. But I let them design whatever they want. And then I have their parents either sign a waiver saying that their young adult is allowed to use the heat gun or if they didn't have a waiver, like some teens just get dropped off without anything, um, I would just say, I'm going to use the heat gun, but you tell me where to go. So the teens will say, oh, more to the right, more to the left, hold it there, hold it there, more to the right, more to the left. <laughs> and the creations were really impressive. There's a lot of craft programs out there where you see the example online or on Pinterest, and you feel a little discouraged when you see how yours come out. This is one of the few ones that these, these, um, these oops, sorry, went ahead a little bit fast. Um, some of the creations, um, they came out really looking a lot like the examples. They, they, we didn't do the galaxy ones in this picture here, but I was really impressed and the teens loved it to the point that the, we had to keep scheduling more because the word of mouth uh, really built it, built fast with that. So again, it's really not that expensive to run. Okay, so karaoke nights is one that I brought up last year because it went with the whole library rocks um, theme last year and I kind of I kind of spent a lot of time like what the heck do I do with it but what I found was teens just like to hear themselves sing and be silly so I had a whole program planned but what it turns out I need to do nothing I just you can go to it's called carafun carafun.com and you can buy for two days a license for $5.99 you just need a microphone and I kind of let them plan it their own way and they, they didn't want prizes, they didn't want to do anything, but you, you can add all that in if you want to, but they have liked it so much that they've asked me to do it two or three other times. And they, they and I said, fine, you, you, you bring in your friends and that's what they've done. Yeah, five ninety nine for a two day license, that's like the cheapest. Right. Like, you, can't, you can't go wrong. It's There's a great nothing. database. It's a right. great database of songs, it's very easy to search. So it turns kind of a laptop into a karaoke machine complete with the advancing text. Right. And use a projector. It's a great, great resource for a very, but what, what, one of the things that we did do with this that might be something you want to consider is we we held it we held all of these karaoke nights after library hours because it can get loud. Yeah. That's uh, so <laughs> if your if your meeting room space or, or activity space is not if it's close to other things, you might want to think about that too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. Or maybe even outdoors. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, and if you want to make a connection, challenge teens to pick songs with a space connection, Bruno Mars. That's that a bad joke. I know it's a bad, bad joke. I know it is. Moving on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Wheel of Fortune. Uh, I've had a lot of luck taking uh, TV game shows into programs. Wheel of Fortune is the one that I like the best, though, and I've created a um, laminated kind of board that has all the, all the spots, with just using Velcro and index cards. And on the other, uh, I've made alphabet letters with index cards and Velcro. And um, we, I just, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, you did. Just, anyway, and, and so we use different puzzles. And the, the added piece to this that I feel is a big draw 
is that I felt like, so we call three kids up to take part in a, in a, in a puzzle, but for all the rest of the kids that come, I didn't want them to lose interest. So when they, when they, when they come to sign in, they pick two letters and sometimes they pick them, sometimes they give it out. And any time the letters that they've chosen uh, is in the, is in the puzzle, they also get a prize. And the thing that I find the easiest is we do um, candy. Yeah. So I, I, I have a wheel. It's a, that's what I was supposed to yeah, say. Yeah. There, there is a free online wheel that they can spin. Um, and I put, you can customize it to have whatever your prizes are. So I usually do things like two Tootsie Rolls or three Starbursts or one mint. And so that when they, when their letter comes up, anybody that has that letter gets that prize. And at the end of the night, the person with the bag with the bit, most candy wins the prize. But you don't even have to do that. They just happen to have their candy bag. Yeah. And it's it's just one of those <laughs> things when you have a familiar property like Wheel of Fortune, the, the teens are excited. They know about it. They want to be a contestant. And you can give them that outlet. And again, like Jen's saying, she's using cheap candy. And that was what she needed. Yeah. For that. So you don't need to go crazy with gift cards. Yeah. Um, so, and then if you want to uh, put this into the summer reading theme, use space related words for your challenge. Very straightforward way to make, sometimes the summer reading themes can feel restrictive, but it's really not, not that hard to make those connections. Take what you use every year and just adapt it. Yeah. All right. One program that I really like running is called puzzle racing. So say you love the idea of an escape room, but really just don't have the time and energy to put into it. Puzzle racing might be a good alternative for you. It's quite literally, it can, oh, and it can be really, really cheap. It can be really, really expensive depending on how, how much you want to spend based on the puzzles you choose. Because what you have to do is buy multiple copies of the same puzzle and set um, different tables up and have teams race to compete. Now, you can, it's very easy to prepare because you literally just put the puzzle sealed on the different tables and you can have rounds. Like you could put an easy, easy kids puzzle for the first round and time people and just keep track of their times and the team who does the all of the puzzles first wins or just have one complex puzzle mm -hmm. and set aside a couple hours and just say the team that finishes it first wins and the puzzles can become the prize which okay. is really built in we did this here and we did uh, a team room puzzle versus the adult room puzzle oh that's cool was, they competed in other rooms and people kept running back and forth to see how who was doing what that's so really that's really very cool. low-key so this one's really cool for the summer reading theme. There's on Amazon, there's a solar system 3D puzzle. Um, it's like $30. So again, I said this can be really cheap, really expensive. So if you wanted to get like five teams and buy five of these, this could be, you know, this could be 150 bucks. But if you wanted to do 10 teams, it's whatever you want to spend. But this 3D um, solar system puzzle looks really cool. Um, so that would be one that you could do. But you could, you probably have a dollar store. So or well, like ask for donations. Yeah. Um, you can't see, but behind us, we're sitting in a room full of puzzles because people, yeah. Once you do a puzzle, you have nothing to do with it. So they donate yeah. tons of money. Yeah, and for the challenges, you want to be identical. But if you have other people yeah, donate people puzzles, donate yeah, yeah, exactly. So you could you could give them as prizes as well. So it's it's a lot of fun. Pretty simple. All right. So then let's talk about the very end of summer when you're just winding things down. Um, you may run a teen volunteer program over the summer. We both do. We have a lot of experience doing these uh, these big teams of teen volunteers who come in. And it's nice to reward them. Or you might just be having an end of summer party for the summer reading program that you were running. Or you might be doing both. Or we you do might both. be doing both. Yeah, exactly. volunteer party and a summer challenge. Uh, the weekend. Yeah. yeah, and again, these are something that could be very, very cheap, very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is where I like to put any leftover of my summer budget because the, um, for, especially for the teen volunteers, I like to celebrate their work and get some pretty cool prizes for them. Again, prizes aren't their motivation, but at mm -hmm. the end of the summer, it's kind of nice to have a lot of prizes for them to win. Um, Jen and I both are huge fans of doing, um, if you're fans of the show Survivor, Survivor, we love Survivor style auctions where we have some items that are, you can see, you nope, can, like, you can, oh, yours are all blind. All blind. Um, I make some, when I've done this, I do some of the items that they bid on um, are, are blind items. So we hold an auction and for every hour that the volunteer worked over the summer, they earn a volunteer buck. And then they bring those bucks at the end of summer to this auction. And so I'll present an item. It might be like a $10 iTunes gift card and then they bid. And then I'll present a blind item and I might lift it up and it will be a $40 iTunes gift card or a can of beets, quite literally a can of beets. So it's, it, the teens get such a kick out of it. It's really funny to see. Um, I may, I've had some great success um, telling local, asking local businesses for donations for these. Um, I don't know. Uh, we have, and mine is not a volunteer auction. It's just an end of summer auction. And it's instead of for the volunteers getting uh, 
book books. I've done it for reading challenges. So for every book that you read, you get one. But I never like to have anybody um, not be able to participate. So anybody that walks in the door starts out with 30 bucks or whatever. And then sometimes at the auction itself, I run challenges so that they can win more money oh, that's and cool. participate. That's cool. All right. So now that that's our rapid fire section and we're going to hand it over to you now for questions about anything we just talked about okay um going back to the activity that you guys did with the crayons and the heat wave um do you use a glue gun or do you just use regular like elmer's glue i have regular elmer's glue worked um okay. you do have to there was like 20 minutes of like wait time for it to dry but yeah just elmer's okay and then we'll give everybody um, a couple of minutes just to get any of their last minute questions in. And I'll kind of, I have a quick question for you guys, just a generic one. Were there sure. any activities that you did either during your last summer reading or ones that you're planning for this year, well, mainly last year, um, that you didn't like after it was over? Any that you would suggest staying away from? Oh, that's a really good that's question. Good um, I'm trying to think. I'm sure, I have. Yeah. Um, I feel like. No, I'm trying to, some of the, one thing that some of, not the in, not the outdoor movie nights, but some of the indoor movie nights were big busts. I mm -hmm. was surprised. We had the, so it didn't cost anything, but I tried to do ones like in correlation with like a superhero movie that was coming out, try to show something else. Um, I, you know, I've, I've done a number of comic cons. They're a lot of fun, but I've always tried to incorporate like superhero movies to that and just no one's interested on those mm -hmm. days. So that it's just, it's not a lot of, a lot of prep time but people just aren't that into and it sometimes it's timing i've i've done prices right and that wasn't such a big hit or, or i've done mini cupcake wars and in the summer it's a huge hit but in the you know the school year it wasn't so sometimes it's timing sometimes it's the different age of you see that the kids change they cycle and yeah. what they're interested in you know one year is not the same the next yeah i almost put in this presentation i used to do um i've done some terrarium workshops for teens yeah and I, it's like jen just said they the teen groups can have a change of personality over time the first few times i did it, it was sold out great attendance mm -hmm. did well i then i did it a couple more times and only half the people showed up a third of the people showed up and it was different people all together so i think sometimes you can wear your own programs out even when they work well mm -hmm. and other times don't give up an idea just because it didn't go well once. Oh, um, I know when yeah. that didn't go well. I was gonna. It was a do-it-yourself year, and we were gonna do do it your own ice cream. Oh, okay. And we and and that should have been outside because yeah. they had bags of ice and milk, and it yeah. spilled all over the room. <laughs> they had fun, but it was not worth it. <laughs> Great. Um, and we have another question. What ages do you typically have or work best for various programs? So, um. Uh, Jen and I both, we hit middle and high school. Um, I used to do, in the job I had for 11 years, um, I did fifth grade through 12th grade. And I didn't usually restrict it. I, there's this, I've heard this thing at different library conferences I've gone to that, you know, 12th graders don't want to go to a program with fifth graders. And honestly, I, I've had a hard time seeing that outside of book groups. Book groups yeah. are a little different, but with the regular summer programming and the competitions, um, it, it's just a really fun environment. So I didn't restrict it usually to any sort of age group. My age groups are sixth grade through 12th grade, and I don't restrict it. However, um, I don't usually get, I don't usually get those juniors and seniors to attend. But what I do get the juniors and seniors are, they, they help run the program. So my cupcake wars are always, I always have two or three juniors and seniors helping out. So Jen, kind of a follow up to that. Do you find that the people who volunteer are people who have um, participated in the program prior to volunteering? Um, no, not well, not necessarily. I, I, I find most of my volunteers are just kids that are looking mm -hmm. for NHS hours. Okay. However, as as I've gone through, I've been here I think five years, something like that. So I haven't been here long enough to know that. But what I'm noticing now is like. The kids that started out of sixth grade and they're seeing those high school kids say, and they say to me, hey, can I run that program when I'm a junior? So okay. I haven't seen it yet, but I think that will happen. Okay. And do you have any tips for doing a cooking program when you only have a microwave? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that, that was something I actually faced mm -hmm. because the first year I ever did a chopped style cooking competition, I did have like the staff bring in burners and 
it was fun, but it was a big, like, you were really nervous the whole time, even though we had waivers galore. So I started doing cooking competitions that you can advertise it as cooking, but we did things like make your own guacamole. and have We them did do that um, ramen, ramen creations this year where we just had hot water. Yeah, and um, ice cream sundaes, parfaits, right. salads, okay. we did one which sound, it might sound boring, but the creativity and the different toppings you get are really fun. We would also, um, I would also do one with a um, mystery ingredient that the first team to claim the mystery ingredient would get bonus points for their final score, but they would have to use it. So sometimes it'd be a chili pepper or it would be, and it would be the ice cream night for the chili pepper yeah. and like different, <laughs> different things like that. It was a lot of fun. And again, it was, um, it, it was, we called it the cooking competition and no one was mad that that was making guacamole. And right, because we don't have a kitchen here. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any sources to recommend for cheap canvases? Um, so go, I'm not sure it's because we're in Massachusetts. There's something here called Ocean State Job Lot, which is a Rhode Island based store. I don't know if they have those out in New York as well. Um, they have really cheap canvases there. And also Amazon, if you just, we use Amazon a lot for a lot of our supplies and you can really, you can find good bulk deals on canvases there from time to time. And just look to search canvases bulk and um, we just make sure you're, your canvases are big enough for the crayon melting. I bought some at first that were really small because I saw this Pinterest thing of these little crayon melting mm -hmm. things I thought would be really fun. It was a nightmare. So get a canvas big enough because the teens want to have something to do. Um, so just get something at least eight and a half by 11 sheet size or bigger. And the more you can afford, the bigger you can get, the better because um, with the crayon, it just looks really, really cool. The bigger you can get that canvas. And we do have a follow-up comment that the store Blick has cheap canvases online. Okay. Oh, so, oh, okay. so that's a good one for you guys too. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll give everyone just a couple more minutes to get those last minute questions in. Um, I want to thank Dan and Jen again for taking time to join us this afternoon. This was a really great presentation. I absolutely loved the background on all of the slides. <laughs> um, I found myself <laughs> chuckling every thank now you. and then. <laughs> no, thank you for having us. Yeah, it's our first <laughs> webinar, so that was really exciting. Yeah. So we've attended quite a few webinars, but we haven't actually hosted one. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, we can call it for this afternoon. Thank everyone for taking the time to join us today, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. All right. Thank right. you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>